Welcome to the Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. Free-flowing talk with a charismatic, down-to-earth host. Join Dean as he interviews and chats freely with his guests, ranging from superstar athletes to politicians, industry titans, and everyday folk with fascinating life stories. Dean educates, entertains, and most of all, touches people's lives. You're listening to the Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dean Blackman Show. This is your host, Dean. Here in the studio is my special guest and friend, Scott Morell. Scott was the founder of Morell Caterers, a catering company which revolutionized the art of catering, creating a five-star restaurant experience in a banquet setting. Emphasizing intuitive service, unique and original catering concepts never done before, and, and a food presentation which looked like a Picasso. Scott set the trends which all others tried to emulate. Morell Caterers was the exclusive caterer in the top three synagogues on Long Island. He invested over $10 million in interior renovation and decor using world-renowned international designer Adam Tahaney. Adam Tahaney has created several restaurants for Chef Thomas Kelleher, including the cel celebrated Per Se and Bouchon restaurants as well as recently opened up The Grill on the Seaborn Quest. He worked extensively with Marconi family, collaborating on eight projects, including Le Cirque 2000, Osteria del Circo, and the contemporary Italian restaurant Serlo. Chef Daniel Boulet and the designer have created three restaurants together, including Boulad's flagship Daniel in New York City. Scott has been an intrigual part of thousands of families' life cycle events in the New York metropolitan area. In fact, I had the personal pleasure of having my two children's bar and bat mitzvahs with Scott. For 25 years, if you wanted the cream of the crop affair, Morel Caterers was the go-to place. Scott was successful because of his obsessive attention to detail and his warm and caring approach to his clients. He truly treated each affair as if it was his own. His philosophy was that there are no rain checks to a life cycle event. Therefore, his unique skills in empathizing the minutia sophisticated management practices and genuine care for his staff assured each party to be flawless. Scott started a new chapter in his life and left the catering business to use his talents of thinking out of the box and his general passion to continue to grow as a person with his life mission to give back to others all the experiences and successes he attained in his career to help people be better in their business and their personal lives. Welcome to the Dean Blackman Show, Scott Morell. Hi, Dean. How you doing? It's such a pleasure finally to be in the studio. And I just have to say, are you in the mood for falafel today? <laughs> Absolutely. And the reason why I say that is because you're referred to the designers, Adam Tahini, and Tahini is an ingredient for falafel. So I thought you were savoring, of uh, enjoying a falafel coming I would, up. I would love to. Okay. I would love to. Okay. Definitely. <laughs> so it's Adam Tahani, but uh, thank you for that really kind introduction. You know, I thought I was going to start to cut down on my length of my introductions, but uh, you are such a unique friend, personality. I used to be your client, and uh, and I've really not met too many people like Scott Morell. that uh, I figured, you know what, it's my show, I could do whatever I want, and... Uh, I wanted to give a real, real serious introduction on you and how I feel about you, Scott. Well, you really did, and uh, I'm humbled by that introduction, and uh, I'm so glad to not only be here, to, but to be part of your show. Matter of fact, your unique qualities, I looked up a word. Did you ever hear of polymath before? No, I have not. Polymath is a Greek word, and it, uh, it stands for very knowledgeable, very worldly. And I never, I haven't met too many people as knowledgeable and as worldly as you. And I don't know how we're going to keep this to just an hour show. Well, um, 
No, that's that's kind of interesting. Um, I like to know a lot about a little things. So uh, I'm a sponge. I like to learn, and uh, I'll give you some stories of my travel. I am a world traveler. Um, I'm also a pilot, and we'll get into that also. So uh, before before we get into that, why don't we uh, some people that you special people that uh, you know that are part of the show? Why don't we uh, why don't we first go over to the UK and and say good morning to uh, good afternoon to uh, Ria Bo. Rhea, are you there? Hi, guys. Hi, Scott. Thank you for joining us today in the studio. Rhea, I love you. I cannot get enough of that. Your accent and your um, British sarcasm and your wit. Uh, it's a pleasure, darling. Again, checks, PayPal, you know, it all works. <laughs> um, absolutely. I actually tried. I almost got scammed today with PayPal. Two people tried to buy furniture <laughs> from me and they said it was my junk mail. And uh, then I went to PayPal and it wasn't there. So I'm a little uh, circumspect on that. So maybe um, the standard uh, Western Union transfer would work. That would be absolutely fine. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Rhea, anything else? Oh, I have a list here. Um, I don't know if you want you want me to start questioning him. You, that not yet. not just yet. Let's uh, let's now introduce uh, Scott to someone else he knows here, special uh, in our life here. Anthony uh, Anthony Lacauzi. Uh, Anthony is a senior correspondent and obviously uh, handles all the uh, sound and controls here in the Dean Blackman Studio here in Setauk at Long Island. What's up, Scott, my man? We have a lot of fun. I love Anthony. He's uh, very eclectic. Um, cool as can be, I found out today, I knew he was in mergers and acquisitions. I did not know that he started on Wall Street when he was 18 years old, and now he has a big mergers and acquisition firm. He's also a tech whiz, and it's sort of like a... He's like an oxymoron in a way. I've never seen a Wall Street guy with all these tattoos on, which are beautiful. So I like that mix that you have, Anthony. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. You're welcome. One of a kind. Scott, uh, you know, going back in time when we met, uh, I mean, my children now are 32 and 29. Uh, so we're looking at uh, 16, uh, 19 years that yeah. uh, Allison had her bat mitzvah with you uh, catering it and Jared uh, 16 years ago uh, it was just remarkable how how I mean how did you how did you first start in catering how did it all evolve and come about well I went to college at the University of Maryland and at the time um, from age 18 to 21 I actually earned my way through college uh, being a licensed croupier at Atlantic City at the Golden Nugget. That's, that is when it was in its heyday. Um, Steve Wynn owned it, and then he uh, pocketed all that money and invested in the new Las Vegas at the Mirage Hotel. And then um, I, was studied for, I studied in economics, and then my parents had a smaller catering operation in a temple in Dix Hills. I knew I was creative, um, I think out of the box, and I'm very... Um, anal when it comes to detail and operations. So my father gave me a, a, a try. Um, I, I remember I came in with a suit that day with an attache case. He says, get that goddamn suit off. Here's an apron. And I went right to the kitchen and I was washing dishes and uh, learned from the back of the house. And a few years later, an opportunity came up at the new Woodbury Jewish Center my father was diagnosed with cancer actually when it opened up and he really was burnt out. He wanted to be with his wife, my mom, Rosalie Morell, who unfortunately passed away a few months ago, but uh, they had a glamorous Hollywood uh, fairy tale type marriage. They wanted to um, enjoy the remaining days at the Fire Island Pines where they had their boat. So I really opened up Woodbury Jewish Center, uh, bought my parents out, and then thereafter, that was such a success. Um, other temples sought me out. I went to, to another temple in Dix Hills in 1997. And then finally, in 2007, I opened up my greatest temple in the uh, Five Towns area. That was just spectacular. And again, designed by Adam Tahani. And what my philosophy was is that um, I got to put myself in the client's shoes. 
Um, I take the party so seriously. Uh, it's 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 my party basically. Um, so I have a passion for making people happy. Um, I get a joy out of that, and to be part of people's lives in their biggest moment, whether it's a bar or bat mitzvah or it's a wedding, um, is such a privilege. And even Dean, what you're talking about, you remember these parties that I did for you 16 and 19 years ago. And it's a testament to how important the party really is. There's no second chances. And I emphasized unbelievable service, Picasso type, um, you know, food presentation, uh, tea dances at the end of a party, uh, all kinds of new service items that really set the trend where everyone would follow. Boy, I'm going to bring you back in time, Scott Morell. Uh, I don't know if you remember when we first sat down to talk about Allison's bat mitzvah. Do you remember we brought in, at that time, into her uh, bat, mit bat mitzvah affair, we brought in the Broadway show, Bring in the, the noise, noise bring and in bring the, in the, the funk. funk. I said at the they same were time. The, they were the hot show, and we brought the cast uh, to Long Island. Wasn't that uh, incredible? It was amazing. Actually, they came from Broadway that night, and so we had to delay it a little bit until they came, um, and that was the after-hours party. And, wow, what a beat they had. I mean, everybody, all all our guests, it just uh, rocked for the night. That uh, The hottest show on uh, Broadway in New York That's was right. at uh, Allison Jill Blechman's uh, Bat Mitzvah. It was, and I still remember it. That's why I said at the same time, I have this photographic memory. But uh, your parties, Dean, were so special. Um, you have a tremendous amount of class and um, trust, and I really appreciate that, and I put my heart into all your parties. I really did. Let's go back in time again. Jared's, do you remember uh, what we did uh, for Jared's uh, bar no, mitzvah? No, if you could give me a little hint like Rhea we, does. We, we had one of my favorites. Um, as I was a young man, I loved her. She was unbelievable. Uh, Taylor, uh, yeah, Taylor, Taylor Dane. Dane uh, I, you, you had to just, give me a chance. What a voice, great music. Uh, loved her, and she was at. Uh, she came in uh, at Jared's uh, at Jared's affair at Woodbury uh, Jewish Center. Do you remember? Not only do I remember it, I was uh, going through two horrific weeks of packing. I'm now move. I'm now moving to my new digs in uh, Long Island City, opposite Manhattan, and going through old pictures and photos i come across this photo of taylor dane in black and white and you know dear scott and she signed it i said that was dean blackman's party so that's why i was going to say at the same time all you had to give me was a hint but <laughs> you really topped it it's unbelievable she was great i'll never forget when i met taylor that night she hugged me and she said dean tell me the truth is it Jared that wanted me, or was it you that wanted me? <laughs> and we know she the truth. She gave me a big hug and kiss. We know uh, the truth. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what a great time. You were just, uh, there wasn't even a close second. Uh, you and, and your parents, uh, just uh, the elite uh, cream la creme. Just uh, no one better and class act, and we will never forget it. Great, and it's so great that we've met up um, 15 or 16 years later to join forces and uh, be part of your uh, show yeah, from the inaugural stage. Unbelievable. Yeah. So, uh, you know, speaking of weddings and bar mitzvahs and bar mitzvahs, you know, someone you've had a chance to interact that's recently uh, been part of the team. Uh, his name is Lovejeet. Lovejeet I got from uh, is a terrific young man, about 21 years old. He's a student across the street at Stony Brook University, uh, Indian descent, and he's uh, in charge of working on the Dean Blackman Show website every day. He does a tremendous job, and it's unbelievable getting to know him. And this weekend, he's kept in contact with me. Uh, he has sent me a lot of videos and uh, messages. So I wanted to ask you, uh, he attended a family event, a wedding in Garden City, Long Island this weekend, a wedding that took place, uh, the bride and groom, in this uh, very hot weather where we're getting, uh, you know, 100 degrees weather out here on Long Island in the New York area. The bride and groom over the weekend came in on a elephant, uh, rode in on an elephant to the wedding at a hotel in Garden City. There were 500 guests. Have you ever, uh, have you ever done a uh, Indian wedding over the years? 
Yes, Dean. I actually did an Indian wedding, but it was absent the elephants. Uh, it was not, um, I guess, a Hindu uh, Indian. It was a Jewish Indian. But um, if we're talking about Indians, I had a Jewish bar mitzvah, and uh, they actually wanted the bar mitzvah boy to be brought in um, on an Asian ele elephant with a 50-piece marching band. I had to coordinate that, and I had to call up Big Apple Circus to give them the measurements of the double doors and make sure this, the, the floor was concrete and there was not a basement, and that was a feat. And uh, that was an unbelievable entrance, but that had nothing to do with culture and religion. I would say that would have to do with beating out the Joneses. <laughs> <laughs> That's unbelievable. Really unbelievable. We've had such uh, such oppressive weather here in the Northeast. Very warm. Um, and I know that uh, the past two weeks, I want to appreciate you being here today and the time. I know you're under uh, a lot of uh, duress and stress. Uh, you know, it's uh, very challenging when uh, you're in the middle of a move as well as uh, moving into a new home. And I hope uh, things are settling for you. Yeah, I'm going from uh, a 9,000 square foot home where I've had, uh, I've never thrown out anything except stale milk, milk and uh, going to a 1,100 square foot New York City apartment. So it's quite a, a traumatic experience. Um, speaking about the weather, no, it, it's, a, it's oppressive here. And, um, you know, I have my thoughts about people's thoughts about weather. A lot. Um, you know, people, you hear the weathermen say, oh, it's going to rain today. You know, they're so gloomy. But l we live for rain. People in Southern California, people in Sahara would die for the rain. And it really depends on your perspective. And it's kind of interesting how we look at rain like it's a negative. We should be blessed when it comes with rain. Um, and then I have my other thoughts of weather people, and this is just kind of odd. It might be, I don't know if this is a good segue, but you ever notice when there's a hurricane coming, uh, the weathermen finally get their chance to be a star, and they get excited. Oh, it's in the Caribbean. It's a three. We think it's going to go to a Category 4. It might go to a Category 5. Oh, it's weakening. Oh, it's strengthening. So they know it's going to hit South Carolina. So you would think a normal person would be happy that it would either weaken as it approaches or go out to sea. But if you look at their attitude, they get more excited and invigorated. Isn't that a little perverse? Wow. You ever wow. notice that? Yes, I have. They get excited have, for destruction. They get really excited. Yeah. Not only that, they're the only people I know of that stay employed that never get fired. That's right. And they get the uh, forecast wrong, like maybe 50% of the time. Yep, all the time. Yeah. All the time. I wish I could do that in business. Impossible. Impossible. <laughs> you know, quite a quite a weekend. Uh, do you follow the Olympics? Uh, you know, I'm Rio. a sports addict. I, I'm a suffering Met fan. Uh, giant fan and Islander fan. I have not really got into the Olympics for some reason this year, except uh, to watch uh, Phelps uh, get uh, set all his records. What a story. Uh, unbe a, unbelievable. What a story. What a great story. Simone Manuel, uh, uh, Simone Biles, uh, just Kerry Walsh Jennings, the, the beach volleyball, just Great people and just great stars. I, 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 every four years, I can't wait for the Summer Olympics to come in. You like the Summer Olympics? I wish they, I wish they came up every two years. Uh, I just love, you love, the, it. love the Summer Olympics. Just a great two weeks. Yeah, really incredible. I think Rio is going to uh, declare bankruptcy because of this Olympics. Probably. Yeah. Probably. Probably. Yeah. And we also, uh, Sharon and I, had a great time this weekend. Uh, have you ever been to uh, the Barclays Center in Brooklyn? Yes, for one Islander game. Good, good. How was it? How was the experience? Uh, not great. Um, I'm a fan of, um, they called it the Old Barn, the Nassau Coliseum. Every seat was great, uh, but the concourse, you could not move, and it would take an hour to go to the bathroom. But um, the sound was wonderful. When I went to the Barclays Center, maybe 25% of the um, arena has an obstructed view. Now, why would you want to go and watch three quarters of a game? Doesn't make much sense. Awful. Yeah, terrible. And I can't see, you know, it was so convenient for Long Islanders to go to the Nassau Coliseum. It's quite a schlep. Uh, it's quite a ride to uh, 
to the Barclays Center. It really is. And I blame the NASA politicians for letting this one go. I think it was a major mistake. But, um, you know. Well, we had a we had a great we had a lovely night Saturday night. We had a chance to see uh, the legendary Barbara Streisand. Wow. At the Barclays Center. It was it was wow. I mean, just uh, incredible. 74 years old, Barbara Streisand. And she still has the voice. And still the voice, the presence, and it was just a uh, incredible. We had such a great evening. Oh, that's wonderful. I mean, to hear uh, "Don't Rain on My Parade," uh, "Funny Girl," uh, people uh, just uh, she did a duet with uh, Jamie Fox. Uh, they did uh, "Climb Every Mountain." Jamie Fox. I love that uh, song. What a talent he is! Uh, besides an actor, man, that's right. That, uh, that guy can that guy can sing. Is that great? I'd love to get him as a guest on the show one day. He's uh, really, really terrific. Well, I can't um, sing. I can whistle. You know, she uh, she. I always looked at Barbara Streisand still today over these five or six decades. I don't know what your feeling is, but uh, I still think she's still number one female. Uh, all those years, number one female voice, uh, no one even a close second to her. I mean, there's some great talent out there today, young talent, some female talent that are great singers, but Barbara, as far as her voice over so many decades, I look at her as being number one. I would, I would completely agree with you. I think the closest second that they said had a perfect voice would be Karen Carpenter. Yeah. Yeah. Karen Carpenter was great. And what Barbara's doing now, she's coming out with a uh, new uh, new record. She's coming out. It's called Encore. And uh, what she's doing, the format of this is uh, she selected some very talented actors and actresses that are, that are doing songs with her. People like uh, Melissa McCarthy, Anne Hathaway, Antonio Banderas, uh, Chris Pine, Seth MacFarlane. Uh, the new album that's coming out, Encore, will be Barbara with uh, with these very talented actors and actresses singing with her. Well, that's going to be in my iTunes playlist immediately. Okay. Yeah. You know, let's go. Let's go over to Ria and bring her into some of uh, this conversation. Ria. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, I mean Barbara Streisand. What can you say? That's that's a treat. That is, Dean. To. Uh catch her at that level and she still has it all going on what a fabulous thing um so kudos to you dean a couple of questions for scott um as i thought you was going to go personal on the past and everything i thought i would try the angle of just scott's views so they know about scott's views not just about his own sort of personal um inward thoughts as it were so scott i uh, just have one question for, well i have a couple uh, what do you think the difference is between U.S. and English humor? Well, I, I find English humor a little darker, a little more sophisticated, um, dry, like a very dry martini. Um, American humor is a little bit more coarse, uh, graphic, um, a little more sexual, if you were talking about R-rated humor. Um, I would think those would be the differences. Would you agree, Ria? Yeah, I think so. I think a lot of British people listen to American humor and don't kind of get it and vice versa. Would you agree with that? Totally. Um, exactly. I think it has to do with a lot of worldliness. I've been to, um, you know, England many times. And once you get to understand the British people and you need to have that kind of sarcastic, dark uh, sense of humor, um, I guess it's a niche for some Americans. I would agree most Americans would not appreciate that humor. No, I couldn't agree more. And as a new person, if they were coming to New York, where could you have any suggestions for them to go on a night out or a few nights out uh, in town and catch some culture and what goes on in New York? Well... That's such a broad question. I mean, if for Yuma, there's always the comedy club and, oh, there's another place. It'll come to me in a minute where I go all the time. It's in Times Square. Um, you know, I like the meatpacking district. I like the High Line, uh, which is great. There, there's so many new areas in New York City that have been redeveloped. Um, that used to be old factories or, you know, um, uh, ethnic areas. So I would stay in the, you know, Village, Soho, Chelsea, Highline area. 
And uh, and then if you want to go shopping, of course, it's, you know, your Central Park Fifth Avenue areas. And, uh, um, you know, it's 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 so hard to pick one place. Um, such u- unique smaller restaurants that don't have the name, but that are that are just precious when you just find them. The little nooks. Um, uh, I would I would tend to go to those. No, I get that. I guess I was after that. You know, when people travel, you see them walking around with their I don't know Lonely Planets book or <laughs> you know whatever. It's, yeah, I know that thing. And um, I thought maybe you may have an insight into those little places that are just classic new york and yeah m- maybe harder to bring up on the spot though yeah it's not coming to me right now um i mean i i used to dine at really high end restaurants like danielle union square cafe gotham bar and grill uh uh um there was another Italian restaurant, oh, Del Posto, which is really nice. But those are really higher end restaurants. There are a lot of little nook and cranny restaurants that um, it's not coming to me right now. But I could get back to you and the audience on those. No problem at all. And just the last one before I go back to Dean. Um, what date is your house party, darling? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one, Rhea. When's the house party, Scott? Silence. Wait, wait, that was back to you. I thought she said... No, no that's for you, Scott. You're moving into your new place, aren't you? Oh, okay. Uh, yes. Oh, oh, it's after Dean. Okay, so I spoke to my decorator in Dean's driveway this morning. Uh, so uh, um, this week it's televisions and cable and moving. And, uh, you know, I think it'll be ready in probably three weeks. So... I would love to have you here. I expect to have you here. It's one plane ticket and uh, Dean and Anthony and we'll all have some cheers and uh, definitely would love that. Sounds fantastic to me. Sorry, I asked you before and you didn't have a date and sort of, yeah, I was just curious to whether you was going to go, whether you was going to go sophisticated or whether you was going to go get the guys around, have some beers and do that kind of angle. Which one are you going to go for? I like to have the place all done. That's just me. And the the design is going to be very, very chic and modern, very New York, uh, because the I'm on the 18th floor of a 33-floor building in Long Island City, and it has floor-to-ceiling windows of breathtaking Manhattan skyline. And uh, you just need to take advantage of that. Um, that that glass when you're designing it and uh i'm really looking forward i'm i love decorating but the the art why i wanted a decorator with me and it's very hard to decorate when you're in a small space uh, because every inch is important i'm very good in decorating large ballrooms or cocktail lounges and so forth smaller spaces require um more of, more of a science um than an art Amazing, amazing. That sounds fabulous. I think we have a superstar among us, guys. Back to you, Dean. Thank you, Rhea. Scott, how's uh, your lovely girlfriend, Shoshana, how's she handling uh, this uh, this move and moving in and the stress of the whole thing? Well, the only thing she's been focusing on is where she's going to put her 25 um, very expensive shoes. <laughs> in with a boxes so all she's all she's been talking about is where's the closet space i said darling we're gonna have um a storage place 10 minutes away there are things called seasons and what we're going to do is we're going to put things in the apartment that are seasonal and every three months we drive 10 minutes away and we uh you know swap the clothing um she still feels that even the seasonal won't fit and uh so that's she has had no comments whatsoever in, about decor she leaves up to me she just keeps saying where's the closets <laughs> so that sounds like that sounds like an experience i went through here in this house so where the studio is uh about 28 years ago uh sharon when we were building this house uh when it came down to closet space uh she got a massive closet space and i got my little space 
And you would think that uh, Emilda Marcos was moving into her, <laughs> <laughs> her closet space. You haven't when seen you my house. About, you gotta see it. <laughs> when you talk about shoes and the little bit of space that I got dedicated uh, for my clothes. Uh, it's a, when you brought that up, uh, that made me reflect on 28 years ago when we were building this house and, and the closet space she got and what I had. Well, my mazel is that uh, my girlfriend uh, is in the fashion industry and she works in an exclusive area in Barney's New York on Madison Avenue. She loves fashion and my home had so many big closets, it swallowed clothes. So we never had to worry about these things. I said, it's a different mindset now. So uh this this will be a challenge, not to me, but to, Shosh to Shoshana. Rhea, I don't know if you know it, but uh, Scott uh, has a very young and beautiful, beautiful girlfriend. I didn't, but I can definitely sort of pick it up on you guys are underestimating the importance of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, uh, she's she's mentioned that, Rhea. She, uh, she'll be a fan of yours. Um Scott, how's your two lovely daughters? Uh, they should be they should be coming home from camp soon, right? Uh, yeah, last weekend uh, they uh, came home from camp, and I finally showed them the new apartment. And my younger daughter, who's twelve, I have a twelve and a fourteen. One's Jade, my twelve year old, and my fourteen is Brooke. Love them dearly. Beautiful girls, beautiful. Thank girls. you. And Jade uh, had a little fear of elevators, and I said that this is a brand new building. It's safe and you have nothing to worry about. Uh, I coached her, we went in the elevator with an escort because my lease doesn't start um, till this week. And uh, she was fine, I said, thank God, because I would have walked up 18 flights of stairs <laughs> every day uh, because it's my daughter, so I would do anything for her. So they, they said it's cool, and I think it's great because uh, they live with her mom, and, which I have a great relationship with, and they live in Long Island, and now they get a chance, instead of going to two Long Island homes, they get a chance to go to the sleek city type apartment and over the weekend they could go into the city in four minutes on the subway i think it's gonna be a great lifestyle wow, wow yeah wow. so looking forward to that now i know that you are a very worldly traveler and i know that when we were together uh, a couple of months ago we had spoken about that uh my son jared who was recently married uh back in early june to the my lovely daughter-in-law his bride the lovely alexa rose um blackman uh, I, I told you that they uh, had gone on their honeymoon at that time to Bali. And it was just uh, incredible that you told me that you've been to Bali uh, 10 times in your, in, in your life. Is that correct? Um, I have an obsession towards Bali. Um, I like to go where people don't go. I like to leave um, America a little bit and leave some of the Americans. <laughs> <laughs> I love my country, but they could uh, piss me off sometimes. Um, so the further beep. you go, I'm sorry, Ria. Oh, so I forgot to get the beep in there. <laughs> <laughs> so I know people, uh, it's a difficult 24 hour plane ride to go to Bali, but um, I go to a resort called Amman Resort. It's a niche resort. And I believe, um, uh, Jared and Alexa went to those resorts also. Um, I've been there so many times that they've given me a shirt called I Am an Amon Junkie, uh, which is kind of cool. Uh, they know me there. Um, it's like home. And the resorts are beautiful. The culture is spectacular. The smells of the flowers smell nice. The It's pristine. And Balinese people smile every time. And they just want to do right. And they just are so happy that were coming to their place. I've never seen a more welcoming group of people. So if you find something that you like, you stay with it. Um, you know, going back to, to travel, um, you know, I have a lot to do with travel. Uh, first, um, I was a pilot for 15 years and that was a hobby and I was an instrument rated pilot. And then one day when I had my first child, Brooke, I was flying around Long Island and I called up the air traffic controller and said, I want to land the plane. It was There was nothing wrong. I never had any incident. I landed the plane, and I called up my partner who owned the, the airplane with me, and I said, D uh, Gene, I'm done with flying. Here's the keys. You can buy my share out. And I never looked back. I know 
that doesn't sound right. It was a cold turkey. And I just said, maybe um, I pressed my luck and everything was good for 15 years. Let me move on to another chapter. And I believe in chapters in my life. So then I took on travel. And that's where I went, of course, to Europe and uh, so many places. But Asia, Far East Asia, I've been to the Philippines, Hong Kong, Singapore so many times because you stop over when you go there. Um, fortunately, I was able to travel business of first class. So the the, the rides weren't so... so uh, torturous but you know you're getting back to uh flying in the united states i don't know if it's like this um ria in uh in the uk but it's really it's really a uh cypress or eyes it's it's you're basically treated like a herd of cattle the 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 airports are more like port of authority i don't know if you've seen LaGuardia, but i don't even like to walk in with my shoes on it's just, uh, it just, it's the whole part of travel. It's just so inhumane right now. So, um, <sighs> you mentioned traveling, Scott. Uh, you also uh, were a private uh, pilot. Yes, and as I discussed that. And and what I did as a private pilot is um, one of the things I wanted to give back um, through my business, uh, through my success in the business, is. Um, I joined an organization called Air Lifeline, and that organization um, uh, represents um, volunteers like myself who would be on call to fly low-income, terminally sick children uh, that needed cancer treatments um, uh, to help themselves uh, fight their cancer so I could get a call next week and they would say scott are you available friday to fly to buffalo and i would say yes sometimes and here's an interesting story i was doing a wedding i was in my tuxedo it was a saturday night i got an emergency call because i was next on the roster for a transplant wow. and um i said well i'm serving the dessert right now <laughs> and they said well you know can you do it um it, the timing is, is an issue um I said, I'm out of here. Um, I took off my tuxedo, put up my jeans in my car, 15 minutes away. I had a father and son meet me. I shook their hand. It was one o'clock in the morning, flew to Pittsburgh. It took me two hours. As I landed, there was an ambulance following us. Didn't say anything, didn't get their names, flew back and you know, kept doing my Air Lifeline thing. Well, a year after that, I'm at a I'm doing one of my parties, a wedding, and a lady at table number 12 asked the hostess, uh, does Scott Morell work here? And she said, yes. He says, can I meet him? And then, of course, she came into the kitchen where I was helping dish out the main course because I do everything in the business. And she said, someone's looking for you. And I don't like to just go up to someone. I like to know who they are beforehand. And she couldn't get uh, an idea. She, there she is. I walked up to her and she said, are you Scott? I said, yes. I says, can I give you a hug? I said, of course, Why? Um, I want you to know you saved my grandson's life. Wow. And that was really something wow. meaningful. That's a great story, Scott. Thanks. Really a great story. Yeah. Rhea, do you, uh, when you fly over here uh, to uh, to the show, would you like Scott to uh, fly her from the UK? That would be perfect. I'm a Absolutely little perfect. I'm, I'm a little rusty. I haven't done it in 15 years, so the the um, landing might have a few bumps on it. You know, I've, I've been on some iffy flights, Scott, I must say. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> Scott, I'm fascinated with this whole background of you as a uh, pro poker player. I mean, uh, in Las Vegas, uh, there was one time where you came in 33rd place in a poker World Series. Uh, tell me how all that came about with poker and, and once again, as a hobby. Uh, just fascinating. Well, I always liked uh, casino gambling when I was young. I used to go to Atlantic City. That uh, prompted me to get my casino license to deal blackjack and craps when I was 18 years old. And I did that in Atlantic City for three years. Um, and I, as I was young, I always had poker games at my house. My father loved playing poker also. And um, the last 15, 20 years, I used to go to Vegas very often and play poker against the better people. It wasn't really for the money. It was more for the challenge and the competition. So I said, what would be the ultimate challenge? I would love to be a pitcher in baseball, but I'm not good enough. I can't pay for that. I can't do that. I'd like to, you know, be a quarterback. I'm not good enough. Wow. But to pay, 
I could be playing against the best players in the world. So I paid to go into the World Series of Poker, and it's different tournaments. Some of 2000, the, the, the World Series of Poker, the major tournament is $10,000 entry. I played in that. I, I got knocked out in the second day, which is not bad. But one of the tournaments, um, which was a $1,500 tournament, um, I played, and I, there was 33 people left out of like 800 people. I could not believe it. And the best player in the world was sitting next to me, and he was the one who knocked me out. I was very short-stacked, and I gave him a bow. I said, <laughs> um, I'm honored to be knocked out by the best player in the world. Uh, it wasn't something that I would retire from. I made $5,600, but <laughs> I, I went online, and there was a, st uh, a flag uh, next to my name under the World Series. So I actually became a professional poker player with that flag. <laughs> so it was kind of fun. Do you know Michael Miz Mizrachi? Yes, I do. Michael Mizrachi, I had the pleasure to meet him. I was at a local restaurant. Sharon and I were having lunch at a local restaurant. All of a sudden, uh, someone reached over to me, just like I met Anthony back in December, shook my hand. They said, uh, I know who you are. You're Dean Blackman. And I just want to say I'm Michael Mizrachi. I said, I don't know who you are. And uh, what I learned was is that Michael Mizrachi today is one of the biggest champion poker players in, in the world right now. And uh, I'd love to get him here as a guest one day. Yeah, I mean, there are people that truly make a living. Daniel Negreo, uh, uh, there, there's so many people that, uh, I, probably 10 that make a living playing poker and make millions and millions of dollars. Um, for me, it was simply a hobby. I haven't done it in a while, but um, I enjoy the competition. I'm very competitive. How about you, Anthony? Do you, uh, do you like poker? I'm um, not a real big uh, gambler. Maybe uh, maybe blackjack, but that's once in a blue moon. So let me ask you something. If the uh, dealer has a seven on top and you have a hard 16, what's your move? Uh, I wouldn't hit on a hard 16 if that's what you want to know. Okay, then stay away from the poker tables. <laughs> I mean the blackjack tables, please. <laughs> the book says yeah. to hit. Yeah. <laughs> They're uh, gonna. Ha you got to assume they have a 10 underneath. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. All Let right. Let's go back over to Rhea. <laughs> Rhea, do you like, do you play poker? Do you like poker? I have played poker in the, uh, in the past, a few bigger games. Um, they wouldn't let girls in, so I couldn't participate, which was a shame. I was privileged once about five years ago, and this wasn't all glitzy Vegas style. This was a smoky room at the back of a you know, a, a classic British sort of pub, but it was all closed. And But I got to watch it, and, wow, the amount of money that that people are confident on what looks like not a lot. So I, that's what I learned from it, Scott, that yeah. people bet on not a lot. Yes, it's all about um, not actually what you have in your hand is what you are projecting that you have in your hand and so you could have a 7-2 off suit, but you could project that you have a pair of kings or an ace-queen, and a good poker player will, will play no matter what they have in their hand. And that's the difference between someone's great and someone's good. I'm not that great. If I have a, uh, two you know, lame cards, I will probably go out. So I'm probably much more readable. That's why... I stayed in the catering business. <laughs> <laughs> no, I get that. Those sounds like good times, those scores. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, now, yes. now, Scott, I, I hear that you like social musings. In fact, uh, is it really true that you were a featured extra in the HBO show Curb Your Enthusiasm? Yes, and... Uh, I have to say, can I say that was the best day before my kids were born? Is that um, not politically correct? Like I had the best day. What's, what, you I... could say whatever you want, okay. Scott. It's your, it's your show. It's my show. And uh, we could say and do whatever we want. So okay, Brooke and your... Jade, I'll give you a tie, okay, on this one if you're listening. Um, yes, I took my mom. I made a, a donation. It was an auction for a very good cause. Hollywood Coalition for the Homeless. Um, I think it cost me around ten or twelve thousand dollars, and um, 
they invited me to be a featured extra. I could not wait. It's my favorite show. When I got there, they loved us. We were so nice to them. They put me in the director's chair. Uh, I was intimidated because I was in the van from the the base place um, to the location, and they had me drive with Larry David. His the back of his bald head was right two inches in front of me wow. and I couldn't say a word to him because he looked Incredible. like he was in the zone and the episode I was in it's uncanny turned out to be the number one episode people say of all time wow. which was Palestinian chicken <laughs> and um, they looked at me with my nose and they put me on the Jewish side compared to the Palestinian side I wonder how that happened <laughs> they threw me a fake yarmulke and I was part of a rally, and the, they put me in another scene where I was in a Palestinian um, restaurant that said, no Jews allowed, um, Palestine um, will take over Jerusalem. It was all fake, obviously. And then you see Larry David and Jeff eating at a Palestinian re uh, restaurant because for some perverse reason, he was attracted to this Palestinian woman, and he was willing to give up basically any Jewish traits um, to it was, it was just so funny, and we had the best time. And uh, I had a Kirby enthusiasm party at my house, and I was on for maybe six or seven minutes as a featured um, extra. So if Larry and Dave and Larry and Jeff were eating at the restaurant, I would be in the back view pretending to eat, and I would have to pretend to talk. And they said I did a great job. It was my first acting role. Unbelievable. Yeah, it was a lot of That's fun. That's great. I mean, Seinfeld, uh, Larry David. I, I love mean, talking about nothing. Just nothing. Just nothing. Nothing. We could just talk and, you know. Uh, I mean, you could, I, give, I, you, could give, you could give other examples of that. About nothing? Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we could talk about this, this studio that you have. You did it in monochromatic uh, beige. Uh, are, you, are you adverse to color? I don't see color anywhere. Just, just as an example, there's still work to do with the aesthetics in the studio. Yes, here. It's, okay. yes. Um, but Thank God we've got uh, top flight equipment here. Yes, you do, and you got great people. Um, you yeah. Know, why don't Why don't we? You mentioned great people. Uh, what are your thoughts, Scott, uh, on the Dean Blackman Show team? Well. Uh, <laughs> What a motley crew we have here. Oh, my God. Where do I start? Easy, Tiger. Easy. No, no. You know I'm not easy, but I'm not mean. But uh, let truth be told, um, Dean um, has a passion. Uh, let's call it an erotic passion for this. <laughs> <laughs> I think the Vachinsky brothers said that about me when yes. we asked them what kind of home they're going to build me uh, one day. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think that was erotic, uh, their comment as well. Well, there was, there's neurotic and erotic. <laughs> erotic is when you want to do, uh, uh, walk around nude in your future class home. Neurotic is um, the barrage of uh, texting that... Uh, uh, Anthony, Rhea, and myself um, endure. Um, Anthony is just so laid back and so cool and so relaxed. There's nothing that bothers him. I mean, I I could really punch him in the face right now, and he wouldn't feel it. It's you know, it's it just it really great, really such a good asset. Rhea, um, wow, um, hmm. She's like the color commentary, uh, witty as can be, um, you know, inquisitive. Uh, inquisitive is great. Um, loves to ask scintillating questions and uh, put people a little bit on the spot. I think the chemistry with our team is perfect. I really do. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's really, it's really <laughs> unique. You're so kind, honestly. <laughs> Listen, a big, big topic that we're going to talk about now is I know that you have a tremendous love for politics. And even Barbara Streisand this weekend made a comment that it seems like every time that she goes on tour, it's during a political year. And uh, obviously, she's extremely liberal, uh, made some very strong Hillary, very favorable comments, uh, a lot of Donald unfavorable comments. Not too bad, <laughs> but uh, but I know that uh, you have your own feelings on this year's political fiasco. 
Yes, very strong. Uh, I'm an independent, and I lean libertarian. So I could say very safely that this year I'll be voting for Gary Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a throwaway vote, but um, unless Hillary Clinton needs it, um, and New York is close. Right now the polls say um, she's 30 points ahead, so I'm, I'm not really going to uh, toss this election. But um, Mr. Trump... Um, especially the last two or three weeks. I don't know how he got this far. Uh, he insulted his way to 16 great candidates. I would have voted for a number of Republicans. I like Kasich. I like Bush. Um, those were two of my uh, Republicans that I could have seen voting for. And uh, with Mr. Trump, um, he's, I think, he doesn't tell the truth in anything he says. He says, believe me, why should we believe him? Um, he's caught in, in a lie in every sentence. Now, I know Hillary is a little cunning, and she's the insider, and people say, you know, she speaks Clintonian language, but um, no one doubts that she's smart. No one doubts that she understands government. Donald Trump, honestly, um, is making a mockery of the United States right now. I think people are laughing all over the world, and um, I don't like divisive nature. People are saying we need a change. And I agree with that. I, I think the, the same old, same old doesn't work. But you don't make change for change's sake. If it was Hillary Clinton and Mussolini, um, you know, you wouldn't take Mussolini, would you? Or Hillary Clinton and Kimmel John, whatever his name is. Um, so it's it has to do with the person. So he's just the wrong person for the change. He's clearly, in my opinion, uh, does not have the temperament, and maybe he has. Um, he'll shake things up, and I think he will. But I think the most important thing in being a president is bringing people together, not alienating them. And he certainly alienated almost every group pros possible, except white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. <laughs> so um, I don't know how that's a winning formula, and. Um, I think he's going to get shellacked, to be quite frank. I think he's, it's going to be the all-time shellacking. Um, that's my prediction. And I was actually concerned around two months ago, but for the last four weeks, I've seen him completely fall apart and um, self-induced infliction wounds that shouldn't have happened. He doesn't know how to stay on message. I think he has attention deficit disorder. I don't think he likes the details. And government is not about, um, just because you're good in business doesn't mean you're good in government. If I'm a CEO, it doesn't mean that I could, when I'm a CEO rather, I could just speak to my CFO and make the changes myself. Well, when you're president, there's a Congress. It's, it, it's, it's, it, you're not the boss, you're a branch. And I don't think he understands that. He says, believe me, I'll do it, believe me, I'll do it. Did he speak to Mr. Ryan yet? Or did he speak to... Uh, you know, Senator Schumer, it's not that easy. So, uh, you know, um, it's going to be, I can say one thing, it's been very entertaining, the politics this year. I'm having, the late night comedians are having a blast. So it's a lot of fun, but I'm I'm just, I'm very depressed about the two selections. Well, we're going to bring in uh, two other people on this discussion that you a few minutes ago paid uh, great compliments uh, to, and uh, that's uh, Anthony and Rhea that I know my mother's anxious. Uh, she would love to be in on this discussion because she is uh, a little bit distressed. Uh, she loves Rhea and Anthony, but she uh, is very uh, distressed over their position uh, on with Trump versus yours. So uh, we're going to bring <laughs> we're going to bring them into the fold. I'm going to put Rhea on the spot first. Rhea, let's go over to you uh, on what Scott had to say about uh, what we're going through with uh, the political fiasco this year. Well, as, as I listen to you speak, I think a lot of the things you point out are right. I mean, I don't think he does like the details because uh, you can't kind of get any details. And I think he has played to the sentiment of creating change. So a lot of what you say, I do agree with. But I guess from my point of view, looking in from the outside, one of the questions I had for you, Scott, actually, was you have how the U.S. view the U.S. in terms of government. And you have how the rest of the world view the U.S. as a government. And I wondered if you would have an opinion on how they differ, Scott. Well, I think we are um, center-focused. 
um, in the United States, we think the world revolves around the United States. And, um, you know, the people in the middle of the country really don't give a damn about worldviews. Um, and understandably, uh, to some of them, they really care about their economic woes and the middle class has shrunk and, and it's all about their pocketbooks. Um, the, I think the rest of the world looks up to America as a beacon of hope and as an aspirational country where they would love their country to adopt some of our, um, you know, rights and privileges and, uh, and independence. And, you know, when they're listening to Trump, I don't think, and I, I don't want to, you know, this is just my opinion. I respect everyone's opinion. I think he's wholly un-American. I think that his values represent everything America is not. Um, they said, um, I think it was uh, Teddy Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, speak uh, softly and carry a big stick. Um, you know, it's not how loud you speak or how divisive you are. It's the class that you stand for and the, you know, the, the rights of, of your people. And, you know, that's what America is about. That's how you get respect. That's where I think hate comes from the outside to the United States. If we have a person like Trump that says, you know, every Muslim is bad. Now, I don't believe that. I believe there's radical Muslims, of course, but you have to, uh, you know, we've had situations with uh, the Jewish population that they painted a broad brush and, you know, people in Cambodia. I don't think that's the way you should be talking. Um, you could still have a, 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 you know, create a safe society in America and not uh, say every Muslim is banned. I've been to Indonesia so many times and those, there's in Bali, the Hindu, but in central Indonesia, they're Muslim. They couldn't be more nice. Um, they're secular. Not everyone is radical. There are Jewish people that are Hasidic that are that will steal your pocket in a second and a half. They're, they're disgusting people. And I could point out to every type of people that it's disgusting. So I, I'm really against the broad brush. And I think other people are very scared that this country is getting very xenophobic. And I think that's very dangerous. Oh, goodness, I think that's already happened. And I agree with the broad brush as well. It doesn't really work. I mean, me looking in from the outside, looking into the US political situation, along with a general uh, view that I've heard a lot of, is it's not so much about the candidate, it's more about the system where the problem lies. And whilst I think you think that the outside world looks in as America as a beacon of hope, I don't see it like that at all. I see, yeah, I don't see it like that at all. Um, but I don't share your view of the way the outside of the the outside world of America sees America. So that's maybe for another day, though, Scott. No, that's interesting, and I I can appreciate that. I think that they would see it much harsher. If um, a Trump was in, in in the presidency, I agree. I, I would agree with that. I think that um, people view America as butting into other people's affairs too much, and I could see the negative aspects of it. That you, you know, we have this idea of American exceptionalism, and we're the best. And I could see that kind of added to uh, penetrating um throughout um other countries so I, I i can understand that ria if that's where you, where you were going with that yeah kind of i mean it's in it's in the sort of nicest possible way because what can we really do about it but especially me as well i mean i'm an investigative journalist and as i go through my days and what i see of america uh for example i mean the show's rocked on and i had some news at the end and when i look in from the outside the new um the, the new law that's passed in Texas is the eighth state for students to carry concealed weapons. The mid country's dying. I went to look at New Orleans as well to paint a brighter picture, still a disaster area. And you look at the US from the outside looking in and go, goodness, you're not looking after your own. What on earth are you doing poking the bear in Eastern Europe? Yes. Um, and, and you know what? Those are all great points. 
Um, and we have a lot to do. I think society has changed. Um, divisions have arisen because we now have platforms through social media and Twitter to get these things out you, you, um, anonymously. So it's it's easier to be divisive right now. And maybe that's what we always were, but now we're showing it. And we do have uh, we do have structural problems. Um, so I would have to agree with that. Um, but I like to think that uh, the glass is half full and our platform of who we are and our constitution, if we stay by that, we'll be on a good path. If we divert from that and start going in a different path and, path and being divisive and uh, not caring for uh, you know all the people and having disparities of wealth like we have, and I'm, I'm not liberal whatsoever. Um, I'm liberally social, uh, so, uh, I'm socially liberal and um, um, monetarily conservative, so I'm somewhere libertarian um, or in the middle, but I have libertarian tendencies. I think that's what we need to do. We need to just uh, stop the divisive politics, come to consensus, and not having the extremes uh, carry the day and the middle, uh, which has apathy, uh, suffer. But it's going to be up to us to get out of this situation. No, I agree with what you're saying, Scott. Um, just to exacerbate the, the point just a little bit more that I'm making, the person, i.e. Trump, and actually my, my favourite was Bernie, but he was never going to make it, it turns out, because he was nobbled. <laughs> but the it's the system. It's the, you know, someone, someone contributes towards a campaign. Uh, am I supposed to believe that these people who don't donate a lot of money don't expect anything back. You're, is, is that is that what I'm expected to believe? No, you and, you, you are. A, and the oops. thing as well is the models when you pick a party is like saying, right, this is the people at the top saying to the people at the bottom, we are going to give you some choice of the social economic model that we want to build for the future. But at the same time, if you look at all those models, they consist of capitalism. Well, the underlying meaning of capitalism is to take advantage of. So therefore, I would take it back to Einstein's theory of madness, to repeatedly do the same event and expect the end result to be different. All the social economic models that you're represented with are all capitalist. So therefore, it's about taking advantage. So I don't see whoever gets in, regardless who, why you would expect the outcome to be different. Well, uh, let me answer that in two ways. And again, excellent questions, Ria. Um, uh, Citizens United was the worst ruling by the Supreme Court that allowed massive influx of money from corporations, somehow that considered people, um, to influence our politics. Um, Hillary Clinton said she's going to change that. Obviously, you know, she might have a chance because there's going to be so many Supreme Court nominations coming up under her reign if she gets in. Uh, so that's the problem. And uh, with the capitalism, uh, you know, unbridled capitalism, I guess Adam Smith's invisible hand is, is, is dangerous. You can't have unbridled capitalism. And we really don't. Uh, we have just a screwed up, um, um, blocked, um, divisive politic right now. Um, when we're talking about capitalism in the United States, I, I, I don't know if you're aware, but 67% of all expenditures goes to entitlement, okay? And then you have another 20-something percent that goes to the military. We have 9% for discretionary income. And so whatever these politicians are saying, both Clinton and Trump, it's a fantasy. It will never happen. So what we have to do is come to our senses, um, um, be smart about entitlements, cut government waste, and um, still have some safety nets. And I think it's it's a it's a balance. And and the last thing is um, we have um, a rigged. I don't want to sound like Trump, a rigged capitalistic system where the big lobbyists with the Citizens United could lobby um, all these politicians because all they care about is the next election, which there should be term limits. That's another story. And um, we, need to, we, we, we need to stop with that because what we really have now is corporate welfare, not social welfare. Oh, I couldn't agree more. 
um, for me, I would vote for the person if I was in the US that was going to change the system and recognise the acts that have been taken at the top by corporates. For example, Glass-Steagall, when the bipartisan um, Bill Clinton removed Glass-Steagall, which was emplaced in 33 because of the Great Depression and people had lost faith in the banksters, they put it in place to keep unbridled capitalism at bay. And that was a, a conscious decision to remove Glass-Steagall, which then just released the banksters to go and fleece the system. So I don't agree with you, Scott, I'm afraid. I think you do have unbridled capitalism. Um, yes. Um, well, what I was saying is, I, I think I was saying is unbridled capitalism capitalism does not work and because of all the barriers or all the protections it's becoming unbridled capitalism and a favoritism to the to the top one percent of the corporations does that make that a little clearer yeah it does it does i just wanted to in a nutshell it's not the people running is the system. Hey, I'll pass it over to you, Anthony. Okay, okay. I'm going to give Anthony a, a chance. Uh, not as long as that dialogue uh, <laughs> took place. So, Anthony, you got to just uh, give your two cents. And, Scott, I'm going to keep you to a, to a minute on this. Yeah, my, my two cents are, did you really compare, tr compare Trump to the North Korean dictator? <laughs> 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 really? Really, Scott? Really? No, what I, I was... <laughs> I love you, Anthony. Uh, what I was really saying is, just because there's a candidate for change, change just by definition doesn't mean better. It could be worse. We could all agree. So they say, well, this system stinks. We need to have change. But is that the person we want to change to? So it's really a competition between who you like the least. And that's what this election is about. I've never seen an election that um, people are voting for who they don't want. Yeah, I agree. I'll leave you with this. I read a great article um, maybe about two months ago written by Howard Marks, who's one of the most brilliant uh, investors of all time. And he says that politicians, uh, when they speak, they talk about doing this and this. So, for example, they want to clean the environment, but they want to grow the economy. Now, it's 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 impossible to do both. You can't you can't clean the environment up and grow the economy and grow business and industry. You have to do one or the other. So all of their agendas are based on this. We're going to do this and this and this, but they just say the things that I think we all want to hear. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, That's move, good point. Moving on and to a different subject besides uh, to bring some closure to this political one thing Barbara uh, Streisand said uh, this past weekend uh, to her audience is this uh, political year is sure a classic doozy. Yes. Okay, on that note, we're going to change subjects. Scott, do you know what the number one top-selling breakfast sandwich is in America? i go with um, maybe uh, bacon, egg, and cheese in a roll. It's the Dunkin' Donuts sausage and egg cheese sandwich. Okay, I just had the different pork product. The reason I brought this up, <laughs> the, re the reason I brought this up is I know you have a passion and we don't have that much time to talk about it. It could be for another show. But you had mentioned to me, Dean Blackman, why are you plugging so much this love for... <laughs> To talk at Starbucks. Yes, uh, I really want. I mean, to I haven't. I'm, I'm expecting any day for Mr. Schultz to give me a phone call uh, <laughs> and we have a conversation about it. But uh, you seem to be on the other side. You seem to have a love for uh, Dunkin' Donuts versus Starbucks. Am I correct? Yes, I think uh, that Starbucks is more of an image. I think they have a better a selection of the gourmet coffees. But when you go to the straight coffees, Dunkin' Donuts. Um, I think just tastes better. It, there's been a test that it has more caffeine, and there's a fallacy with Dunkin with Starbucks. Uh, people think when it's bitter, it's stronger. No, it's just bitter. I love that dark roast of Dunkin' Donuts. The only reason I don't hang out in Dunkin' Donuts 
is the comfortable social aspect exactly. environment exactly. that I have in Starbucks. One's like a McDonald's and right. one's like a hotel. Right. But their coffee is delicious. And it's when great. I was younger, I was able to eat so much of their products. I mean, I used to love in the morning. I love that <laughs> that cinnamon coffee roll with all the glaze on it. I had it I this mean, morning. I used to have that every morning on the way my drive to work. A dark roast Dunkin' Donuts coffee it would end up on my shirt a little bit, and I used to have yes, all the time exactly. that yeah. delicious. But I, I can't, I can't eat that anymore. It's just uh, the calories and the sugar that's in the variety of the Dunkin' Donuts products. The, oh, I can't. I, I, it's just, it's just too much. It's a killer. That smell when you walk in there. It's, it's just, I, a, it's I, just an absolute killer. I, I still should. I, I eat it all the time. In fact, I had the coffee roll and the donut and the coffee coming to your studio, and my girlfriend says. Um, you're growing a belly, you need to stop. <laughs> <laughs> but I can't, I can't resist. <laughs> Rhea, so, you haven't seen that yet. Let's let's move over to great conversation. Let's move over to Rhea. Let's go over to the UK. And I know Rhea has uh, all fun stuff for us. Uh, her Let's Question It segment, her ditties, her on the spot, and some breaking news. Rhea, it's all yours. Okay, darling. Great, great first part of the show, guys. I love the sound of the coffee. And and the dunking thing, oh, I love it. Rhea, I thought I thought this was going to be the first show that you didn't say darling to me, so thank you. <laughs> 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 okay, sweetie, right, moving on. So uh, I'm going to miss off the ditties because time's going by and go straight to guess the U.S. accent, okay? Um, so are you ready for this, guys? Ears open, this is a short take. Guess the region and here it comes. Did you eat them baked beans? Yeah, yeah. They were awful good. <laughs> <laughs> any any ideas or would you like it again? Did you eat them baked beans? Yeah, yeah. They were awful good. Where's he from? Um, this is a this is a shot in the talk, uh, Louisiana. Oh, okay. No, that's a good guess. That's a good guess. Anybody else? Open dialogue, guys. Dead airs, no good. Anthony? I go with uh, Pittsburgh. <laughs> Pittsburgh. Wow. Wow. I was going to say Ohio. Okay, one more time. Did you eat them baked beans? Yeah, yeah. They were awful good. <laughs> New Orleans. Uh, that's all I could think of. Uh, New that... Orleans? <laughs> New Orleans. <laughs> okay, I'm going to tell you it's Maine. Wow. Oh, my God. Oh, Maine. Yeah. Wow. One more time for Maine. Did you eat them baked beans? They were awful good. That's wow. Yeah, it's got that New Hampshire esque. It has when you listen carefully. Yeah. But I understand how someone would think it was Louisiana as well. Okay. Okay, ready for the British accent? Yes, love that. Here we go. Open floor. Scott, you, you know, just be, uh, watch the guys, see how they do with it before you jump in on this one, okay? Sure. You know, uh, you know, Arthur, Arthur John, the uh, funeral director, well, he's uh, taken over um, uh, Tom Pepper's. Uh, he's turned it into uh, Caribbean bar. They do, like, pina coladas. Um, they do shots of Jaeger. And uh, they do sabukas. Where do you think? That's, like, a inner city part of England, probably. That's definitely not, like, in a rural area. It sounds okay, more okay. of like a slang. Kind I of. would agree with Anthony uh, that that's an inner city of Europe. Kind of downtown inner city thing. Yes, definitely. Scott? I'm going to take a stab at Belfast, um, Northern Ireland. Wow. Belfast, Northern Ireland. Stab. Okay, okay. That's a pretty this good stab, Scott. Uh, probably wrong. Not bad, not bad. Okay, it's not. It's Welsh. 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 Wow. God. Okay, let me play it again just so so you guys know what a Welsh accent... Well, this is actually a particular Welsh accent, but it's the one that I could find that sounded the most Welsh. Here we go again. You know, uh, you know Arthur, Arthur John, the uh, funeral director, well, he's uh, taken over um, uh, Tom Pepper's. Uh, he's turned it into uh, Caribbean bar. They do, like, pina coladas. Um, they do shots of Jaeger. And uh, they do some bookers. When he says pina colada, um, that I felt was the giveaway, but obviously not enough. Yeah, not for us over here, no, across the pond. No, no, yeah. okay, so you're learning more, right? I mean, that is a Welsh accent. Okay, so we're now going to go to guess the celeb. 
again, I'm just going to play a bit of the clip. They're super well known and see it's an open floor and see how we get on with this. This is not well, it's not my house exactly. Oh, come on. All right, that was it? That's Pacino. Go again, Rhea. Go again. This is not well, it's not my house exactly. I've rented. I agree with Anthony. I'd say it's uh, Al Pacino. Okay, we've got an Al Pacino. Just to, just to be different, I'll go with uh, De Niro. Oh, good call. It's Al Pacino. Wow. wow. Hey. <laughs> nice call, guys. I'm flunking this one. Okay, over to sport time, okay? Right, we're ready for the sport. How are you on your sports, Scott? I love sports, but it depends on the sport. Well, I hope it's not basketball. On... Okay, well, we're learning as we go. This is courtesy of Wicked Vids, Kev Knight, who, who looks after the sports side of things. And we're trying to get them positioned to play towards your strengths, yeah. but also make them reasonably challenges, challenging as they go on. Okay, question one. MBL World Series winners, who, after the New York Yankees with 27 World Series titles, is the next most successful team with how many wins? I know that answer, but not the wins, but I know the answer. Does everyone want to take a stamp? Go ahead, Scott. Open floor. It, 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 open it's, floor. It's, open it's, floor. Yes, it's going to be the St. Louis Cardinals. Okay. And and how many wins did you say the Yankees had, Rhea? Uh, 20, uh, 27 World Series. I'll go with... Uh, I'll go with 20 for St. Louis. Okay, Dean? I'd say the uh, Cardinals and the Giants are up there. Okay. Anthony? Uh, you got me there. I'm not... I, no, no, no. Okay. Know. Sorry, Donna. I'm still working on the ones to play to your strengths. So it was the St. Louis Cardinals. Wow. Scott, you just won uh, dinner for two to the Dean Blackman show. I can't nice. wait. Where are we going? <laughs> and they had 11 wins. Oh, 11. Wow. That's a drop off from the Yankees. Okay. Question two. In the Super Bowl... The New York Giants have four wins to their credits. How many, if any, do the New York Jets have? The New York Jets, I'll take that one. The New York Jets have one Super Bowl with Broadway Joe Namath, 1969, the same year that the New York Miracle Mets won the World Series. Whoa, nailed it. Wow. How do you like that, guys? Well, I, I don't want to say anything, but I had that also. Huh? But I was going to just uh, um, have a little bit more hyperbole. I knew that because I'm a diehard Met fan, and uh, I know I'm a diehard Giant fan, and we compete against the Jets, so they only had one. I but that, that was a great call. Okay. Scott, I was a young kid back in 69, and I remember the World Series was only played during the day. I did every, I wish we could get my mother on the phone. Uh, I don't think she knew this, but every day I did everything possible to bring on a fever and fake, <laughs> and fake being sick. So, so I, could, I could stay home and watch the Mets play in the World Series. I mean, I used to, I would cry when Tom Seaver would lose. I idolized him so much. That was... And then I had an opportunity to meet him personally at uh, my great friend uh, Orlando Cepeda, the great uh, right. San Francisco Giant and St. Louis Cardinal, Cha-Cha, the baby bull. Uh, we were at his uh, Hall of Fame ceremony and had a chance to meet uh, my idol, Tom Seaver. Well, that's where the amazing mix came from, the 1969 Right, right. so that's how I knew that uh, that answer to uh, to the Jets. Great, great. That was a okay, great year. Guys. You was getting competitive there, so I'm going to put just add a bit more to the question. Who did they beat? Um, I believe they beat the Colts. Um, the Jets beat the Colts. Okay. Correct. Okay. That's and correct. Dean? The correct. It's the Colts. It's not. It's Baltimore. Yes, that's yeah, the Col the Baltimore Colts. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Colts have moved, uh, yeah. <laughs> Rhea. They're Rhea, now in Indianapolis. Rhea, I love you, but you got to get, if you can ask the questions, you got to get a little bit more current. <laughs> I felt that as I said it. Uh, oh, right. Okay. What work with the guy who does the questions? Uh, anyway, never mind. Question three MBA history. Who currently tops the ranking with the most career, sco career points scored? 
um, I would have to say, uh, you know, I'm not a big NBA person. I will have to say Michael Jordan. No. No? It's LeBron. Even oh, I know that's that. right. You know what? You're right. Rhea, your question again is most points scored by a single player in the history of the NBA? I've got NBA history. Who currently tops the ranking with the most career points scored? Uh, is, is it uh, Will Chamberlain? No. Nobody's got it yet. Nobody's got Okay. Um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? Yep. Spot on, Scott. Wow. wow. I don't Scott. follow basketball. Okay. Amazing. I, it was just like, thank you. Amazing. <laughs> thank you. Wow. Okay, we can take it to another one as well. Any idea what his total was? Which is a, obviously, a, I guess, a stab in the dark. I'm not going to try it. I don't know. Probably around uh, 35,000 points. <laughs> wow, that's so close. It's 38,000. Wow. Oh, good, good call. Pretty team. good. Huh? Oh, my God. <laughs> Pretty good. Pretty good. Go get Lotto today. <laughs> wow. Yeah, right. Okay. So I hope uh, about... I hope uh, my son Jared, uh, who works at the NBA, and all his uh, peers uh, heard that one. I hope, hope they're listening to the show. Very how well I uh, know my NBA uh, Boy, history. They could be strutting down the street today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I got one more, which is a stab in the dark one, which was a bit of an amazing thing that was come across. Uh, how many people attended? A major league baseball event in 2015. You know, that was probably an event outside the United States. I know they played. Oh, I think I know. And it's, it's, she means the total. We, oh, the yeah, total. The total. Yeah. Oh, no. Uh, yeah, but I think the total would have been outside the United States. Um. So your question is how many people attended uh, during the 2015 Major League Baseball season. How many people came through the gates and attended uh, games in in America? Is that correct? I think so. Yeah, that's what I read. Well, into. can I? Did you say America or just a Major League Baseball game? Uh, it just says Major League Baseball event. I would assume in the U.S. Well, she sees the answer. So my my know. answer my answer would be between thirty and forty million. Anybody else? Mm. Wait, wait, for one game or the whole year? The, the whole, whole year, year, the whole season. Oh, Total attendance. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Total attendance. It's got to be over 20 million, I would say. I would say... I would say 35 million. Whoa, it's 33.9. Wow, we were close, Scott. You, you were real are close. Good we're song, good. Mate. We're good. You are good. You know why? why uh, questions uh, when you're kidding, aren't you? Well, the benchmark in New York for the Yankees is they always said, can we reach 3 million? So I knew that was like the real high end. And so I went a little bit higher. Let's move along. Uh, time is moving quickly. Okay. So on the spot, a relatively easy on the spot, certainly something you can have a go at. It's about what states border other states. So the first question is, how many states border Florida and what are their names? Okay. I, Scott, take, sure. a, take uh, a step. Sure, we have uh, Georgia. We have Alabama. We have Mississippi. And um, not quite sure. You said oh, this one, it might be Louisiana, but that's a, that's a stab. Yeah. That's what I'm going with. Anybody I'm, else? I'm going with what I'm going with what Scott just said. Okay. Yeah, you're spot on. Wow, nice. Scott. Geography is my uh, one of my majors. I didn't tell you that. Right. Yeah. Did tell you same as I as would. Well, right? I would. Next I would say without uh, being a quarterback and a uh, baseball pitcher, I mean, I don't think there's anything that you don't know. Um, I don't know how to use a hammer and a nail. <laughs> I'm good with a, putting a light bulb in. But I know that um, the capital of Madagascar is Antananarivo. I know things that have no useful purpose whatsoever. Once again, when you bring up stories, it brings back history of my own. When we moved into this house approximately 28 years ago, I, I first gave my first experience with a hammer. I went out and bought a hammer. I thought I'd use it. 
I brought out, bought up some screws and a screwdriver. And my first experience and my last time using a hammer was when I had to start with my first toilet roll holder in the upstairs major bathroom. <laughs> and I put these screws directly into the into the wall. I didn't know that you need to use mollies to, yes, for to keep rock. them in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's that's when I knew I had to work hard because my uh, experience working with tools came to a stop. So my limitations, my limitations as Anthony's experienced with me here is I change light bulbs in the house. <laughs> I'm just like you, just like you. So go ahead, Rhea. Okay, question two. How many states border North Carolina? And what are their names? Wow. I could take a stab at that, but that's going to be tough. Do you want to try it, anyone? North Carolina. I, South Carolina. <laughs> it's on one. one side. Yeah, South Carolina. Then Virginia. you get up to uh, Maryland. And... Okay, I, I'm going to say... Maryland, for, South for Carolina. North Carolina, I'm going to say Virginia. Yeah, Virginia. Virginia, yeah. I'm going to say South Carolina. I'm going to take another stab... Uh, no, it's not West Virginia. It's going to be Tennessee, Kentucky, Kentucky. Yeah. Uh, Kentucky and Tennessee. Yeah. Sounds right. Something like that. Oh, yeah, not bad, guys. It's three, and it was Tennessee. So wow. South Carolina, Virginia, wow. and Tennessee. Okay, I did one more. All right. Yeah, no, no, you're really close. It nearly does, but it doesn't quite, right. quite get there. So not bad. So that's really good as well. Right, here's the next one. How many states border Texas, and what are their names? A little bit further afield with that one. I could do that. Uh, that's tough. But... You got Oklahoma's one right on top. One. Okay. We have um, Arkansas. T. We have Louisiana. Three. And uh, you said Oklahoma. So the left of that is going to be New Mexico. You got it spot on, guys. It's four, and you just named them. Wow. Excellent. Wow. Teamwork makes Look a dream at this work. team. <laughs> I told you this team has chemistry. Good stuff, right? And now, just to lift it up another level, this is a difficult one. It's a bit closer to home, but here's the question. As a bonus question, how many states border Tennessee? God, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. That really is. You're, you're really making this difficult, Rhea. So I didn't ask you to name them. It was how many. Okay. Dead air. We don't want dead air, guys. Come on, six. dial up. Six. No, no, hold on. Oh, six. Oh. One, two, three, four, five. Go ahead. I'll go six. I'll go six. What was it, Rhea? It's eight. Eight. Oh, my God. Wow. That's Why a lot not? of some, the two on the sides. Yes. Three on top, three That's on a lot bottom. of border crossings, yeah. especially when uh, we I'll... secede from the union. <laughs> Would you like me to tell you what they are? Yeah. Uh, it's Missouri, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia. North Carolina, Virginia, and Kentucky. Mm, that's really mm. a landlocked state. Mm. Yeah, no, it is. I saw it in there and thought, look, wow, look at how many join that. So, yeah, that, that was the sort of, a, you know, that was the pinnacle of the toughy one. And I move it straight on to the Let's Question It segment. And the question is, can Earth keep up with the human growth? Open floor. I'm going to leave that to Scott and Anthony. Can the U.S. keep up with the population growth? No, no, no. Can, the world. can Earth keep up with oh. the rate of growth of population? Oh, the world. Okay. Uh, statistically speaking, uh, no. I mean, is that an opinion question or you want to know if it's possible? It's just your thoughts. It's oh. to bring thoughts. There is a point in which the Earth can't sustain anymore. I think we uh, actually, I know for a fact that we can, but most people are, are congested around major cities. And if those people were spread out, we'd have more than enough room and resources at the current moment for the six, six or seven billion people that we have on the planet. Well, yeah, the consensus of, of the population is, although it's hard to get accurate, is somewhere between 7.5, 7.8 billion people. Okay. Um, I would think that we could have a lot more. I, I agree with Anthony that if we move from the beaches and the rivers and go to different areas of the world and uh, we have more climate control and um, um, consume 
different products that doesn't create uh, CO2. I think um, we would have to make major changes in our lifestyle. And if we did that as a, as, as a global initiative, I bet we could uh, have probably 15 or 20 billion people. Interesting stuff, Scott. Dean? I don't, uh, I said I was going to reserve this for Scott and for uh, Anthony. Sorry, darling, I, d I didn't hear you. Not okay. a problem. So, so just a quick overview of, um, there is a limit, there is a current limit under the current social economic model, which shows no signs of change. And that is research done by Edward O. Wilson of Harvard University fame, studied, did a PhD in this. And the world on its current model can support at the most around nine billion people. Nine billion. So we're pushing the limit here. Wow, right? that's scary. I didn't we know are. that. I didn't know that. And he also said if the world went vegetarian, you might push 10 billion. Amazing. Wow. <laughs> that is interesting. Rhea, is there anything on news that you want to bring before, uh, before we start to bring the show, today's show to the close? Uh, certainly. I spoke about some of the news. Um, we can close it. The news is not uh, anything poor or anything. I'm just, just cruising down the news. There's some quite interesting stuff, but as the show has gone on, um, I'm happy to... I'll, I'll bring up one segment. Let me just... I'll just skim across the top. Current stats came out. Um, the, uh, the rate of bankruptcies has just gone past the 2009 crash rate so there's now more people going bankrupt in companies than there was just after the crash of 2009 facebook are under investigation by the irs and amazon are next in line so they owe, they owe huge amounts of money and they just they just haven't done it and uh, i've got some stuff on julian assange but that needs breaking down so i'll do that another day dean so back to you well thank you ria Appreciate it, uh, Scott. It's been quite a quite a show here. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. I loved it. Uh, this is it's like family here. It's great. Before we close, I, I think it's important to talk about uh, what you're doing currently and and the future. Um, you know, obviously, everyone knows that you're a senior correspondent writer for the Dean Blackman Show, and everybody could enjoy your writings. Uh, Every guest has a pre-show uh, summary uh, before a show, and there's a post-summary that you write after every show and after every guest is on. Uh, there'll be other writings that you will do throughout uh, the weeks as well. You can catch it on Facebook. Uh, I know that. And I know that you're very busy with your own personal blog that is called 1012 Insights, and uh, that you're uh, also involved with Vistage, so uh, it's all yours as far as what uh, what you're doing besides uh, the Dean Blackman show and and the writings, the great writings that I'm appreciative that you do. What else? Uh, what else do you want to tell the audience uh, that you're doing? Sure, I'll make this brief. Uh, <clears throat> I started blogging over a year and a half ago. I named the blog 1012 Insights, and people would say, "What is 1012 Insights about?" And basically. Um, try to take me seriously here, everyone. You too, Rhea. Um, I notice that everyone is always saying 10, 12 all the time. Um, for instance, you go to a gas station and you want to find directions. They would not say, yeah, it's 11 or 13 miles from here. They would say it's 10, 12. Or how many people can you seat at this table? You want to say eh, between 8 and 11. You would say 10, 12. Um, I haven't seen you in so many years. You wouldn't say between seven and 12 years. You say 10 and 12 years. So 12 is the ish of 10. That's my own shtick. So I named it after that. And my writing has to do with politics, humor, satire, uh, psychology, philanthropy, and social musings. Regarding Vistage, uh, Vistage Worldwide um, uh, existed since 1957. And what it is is a peer-to-peer -peer advisory group and i am trained to be a vistage chair a vistage leader there are 650 vistage chairs with 22,000 members across the world um what i what i have to do is form a group and they will consist of ceos 
owners of companies, mom and pop companies, but they have to be leaders in their business. They have to be growth minded and open minded. And with a collaboration of 12 to 16 disparate um, leaders, um, they could talk confidentially and through this um, issue processing um, tool that we have through Vistage, uh, we will issue process a lot of their issues. It could be human relations issues, communications issues, expansion issues, and it's just remarkable. And when you're a CEO or owner, you're normally on the top of the triangle and you don't have anyone to talk about. Basically, you're lonely. And what Vistage does is gets these 12 to 16, quote, lonely business people together so they could hear different points of view rather than an echo chamber. And it and what happens is um, companies that have members in Vistage outperform other companies three to one. So I am now a certified Vistage chair to hopefully enhance uh, leaders' personal and business lives. I'm very excited about that. Very exciting, Scott. So regarding Vistage, uh, tell the audience that if uh, anybody wants to get in touch with you regarding Vistage, uh, follow up from this show, what's the best way for uh, my audience to to uh, reach you? I would suggest going on to my LinkedIn page, and my name is uh, Scott Morell. And uh, if you want to email me personally, it's uh, Scott, S-E-O-T-T, dot D as in David, dot Morell, M-O-R-R-E-L-L, at gmail.com. And I'd love to meet with you and uh, hopefully select you and you select me. It's a mutuality process. Scott, thank you for being here at the show today. Really appreciate it. It's been quite an experience, uh, one I'll never forget. You're a dear friend and truly tremendous, tremendous value to the show. And I can't thank you enough. You're welcome. And next time, we're not going to talk about uh, my business or anything. We're just going to um, have a comedy show if we could do that. <laughs> <laughs> Rhea Bo, I want to thank you very much for today. Uh, if you want to say goodbye to Scott. Hey, no problem, guys. And it would be lovely to have you here again, Scott, to chew the fat. Same here, Luria. And Anthony, uh, anything you want to say in closing? Always love hanging with you, Scott. As I always say, uh, we want to hear from all our listeners. Uh, our listeners can reach out to us with the free text number for U.S. residents, which is 631 631- 372-8849, 631-372-8849. We'd love to hear from all of you. Include your name and we will mention you on the show. Please don't forget to like us on Facebook and to hit the subscribe button on the show's YouTube channel. If you'd like to leave a comment, use the box below. If you'd like to share any of your stories, any of your ideas, and to even be a guest on the show, go to deanbleckman.com and email. I would like to thank all of my listeners for being with us today. And until next time, have a great day. You've been listening to The Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island, New York. From all of us here, we'd like to thank you for tuning in. We look forward to hearing your comments via Facebook, Twitter, Skype, and email. And don't forget, you can visit the webpage anytime for the up-and-coming guest list. From all of us here, have a good evening.